Dr. Gipp has been the leader of the United Tribes Technical College since 1977. Thank you. It's an honor to be here with uh, all of you today and to hear uh, the presentations that have been made. Uh, uh, these two fellows that were up here, it's a hard act to follow, I can tell you that much. Uh, but uh, I'm Dave Gipp. I'm originally from 48th, North Dakota, just down the river on the west side. I know a, a good number of you over the years, or worked with you in my early youth. Uh, one of the things I learned back in the early 70s, I was uh, uh, the youngest delegate at that time uh, to the North Dakota's second constitutional convention. And uh, we worked very hard. I found out what nonpartisan was and what partisan was in those days, even though it was a non-political event. <coughs> Uh, that seemed to be the label of it. But I met a lot of good people, and many people who became leaders of our state, or who were then, and a few now, that are left in public office or public service. So that gave me a very good taste of what North Dakota was about from the state side. I was a tribal planner with my own tribe back in those days at Standing Rock, and I was very nationalistic about my tribe, uh, about the needs and the wants and the desires and the aspirations of our tribe. Standing Rock is made up of the seven bands of all of the Lakota and Dakota people, by the way, at least historically speaking. And at one time, we had all three of the dialects on our reservation. Primarily L is spoken and D as well. Dakota, which by the way, as you all know, uh, many of you know, I should say, means friend or ally. Quite the opposite of what Sioux means, which means enemy or snake-like, or vicious, etc. So our name is, stands for, quote, the people, uh, as is the word used in many other indigenous cultures. And so our word is Lakota, or Dakota, or Nakota. And you go to UND and you'll see three of those rooms in uh, the Memorial Union, uh, places where I used to hang out when I was a student. But my point being is uh, we always viewed ourselves as the people as friends and as allies. So that's my lecture for the day on Native American culture or whatever. But uh, getting back to this topic, civil rights and social justice, I think it is a very timely theme for what we are going through in North Dakota and what we will continue to go through in North Dakota, not for the next two to five years or 10 years, but for the coming generation, the little ones who have no idea what they're growing up into. And so it's incumbent upon us to try to find the correct path or the pathway, the pathfinders, if you will, to continue that work of finding equity, good solace, and good ways to come together in a great state of great change. I look at that and I think we do have indeed a challenge in every one of our communities, in every one of our little hamlets and villages and cities throughout this great state, and as we overlook the Missouri here and see the changes that are coming. So I thank you and I commend you for being here today. And I'd like to look at that, that theme and part of the topic that I've picked out today, Pathways Toward Justice, the intersection of American Indian tribal rights and the civil rights movement in 1963 and how those came together. And I'll give you some examples of that. But before we do, I wanted to show, and I thought our presenters were going to show uh, a, a bit of the clips uh, that we have on Robert F. Kennedy when he addressed the National Congress of American Indians uh, 50 years ago uh, on September 14th, 1963. Addressed at a hotel downtown, which was the thriving place for all kinds of people to meet, political parties, state leadership, private leadership, all of those people. And it was a place where our Indian leaders frequently gathered. Al Wolf will recall some of those meetings at the Grand Pacific Hotel when our tribal leaders would come together, like people like Louis Goodhouse, uh, the late James Henry, uh, many others from our four or five major tribes in this state to come together. And Robert F. Kennedy came here there was a huge parade. You'll see that in some of the pictorials off to uh, your right, to my left. And you'll see how the Bismarck Tribune covered it. 
we were the mainstay of coverage by the television news and the radio news of what was happening in Native American affairs. And more importantly, what was happening, and there's a headline of some of the strife that was going on about civil rights at that very moment, those very days in 1963. But I thought I would show you the brief piece of Robert F. Kennedy when he spoke to the National Congress of American Indians at their 20th meeting. This is in Bismarck, of course. Attorney General Robert Kennedy, rated warmly in Bismarck, North Dakota. The brother of the president and the nation's top law enforcement official arriving for the 20th annual conference of the National Congress of American Indians. We have a very strong feeling about the Indians. The president was made in India about two and a half or three years ago. And uh, so uh, we're very anxious that they make progress uh, with the rest of the country. And I think it's been an ignored group frequently. Uh, and uh, this administration is extremely interested in trying to do something to remedy the situation. In addition to the fact that the Indians have contributed so much to the country, and I don't think the country's always treated them with the greatest fairness. So we are, from personal feelings as well as our own official responsibilities, we're extremely interested in trying to do something with the Indians. On the Attorney General's mind, expanding the scope of civil rights, including more minority groups who've been denied justice in America. Drive uh, for civil rights, uh, which involves the Negro now, because that's the largest minority group, is uh, not just on behalf of the Negro, it's but on behalf of all minority groups that have been denied their rights and uh, who are subject to injustices because of their color or their racial background. I think that includes Eskimos, includes the Indians, includes the uh, Latin Americans, who uh, in some parts of our country have the equivalent only of a third year education. It includes in some areas of the country uh, Chinese and Japanese. But I think the focus of attention is on Negroes now because of the large numbers of Negroes spread all across the country and people are much more aware of it. But I think that this effort has to be made on behalf of all these groups. I don't think that we're meeting our responsibilities if we just do it as far as the Negroes are concerned. Kennedy led on that the Department of Justice has investigated some civil rights complaints in Indian country, but so far they found no violation of federal law. But the head of the NCAI says discrimination and prejudice are quite evident against Indian people. Robert Burnett promised to bring victims and witnesses to the convention who suffered police brutality in South Dakota. The jurisdiction question front and center on the agenda. Washington, D.C. Attorney Marvin Sanosky speaking about Public Law 280. Who should have criminal and civil jurisdiction on reservations? Is it the tribes or should it be the states? And other issues, land airship, unemployment that averages 44%, and health inequalities. That these conditions can be allowed to prevail among a people uniquely entitled to call themselves the first Americans, a people whose civilization flourished here for centuries before the, the name America was thought of. This is nothing less than a national disgrace. Poverty, undereducation, and disease are evil forces in their own right. But perhaps their most destructive effect in a society like ours is that they breed a practical loss of freedom. But it wasn't all business for the over 1,000 NCAI delegates and their families. Indian dancing and an Indian art show. An international bronco riding match in Mandan with a beef barbecue serving 3,000. And record-breaking crowds for an Indian parade through downtown Bismarck. 10 to 15 deep along the streets, probably the biggest parade crowd in the history of the city. And high honors for the Attorney General. And he was a member of the American Indians. And he was bestowed upon him an honored chief of the American Indians. 
here in downtown Bismarck. So uh, I point that out mainly because I think it brings you a little bit of his humanity to you directly uh, with the coverage that was given by our media at that time. Uh, I would also point out that he came here at a time when the North Dakota tribal leaders were thinking about their future and about the future of their people. And one of those issues was whether the state of North Dakota and states like South Dakota, and states like Montana, Minnesota, Nebraska, and on down the line, would, be, uh, would take up the mantle and the responsibility of having civil and criminal jurisdiction over Indian people in the Indian lands or territories, let's put it that way. The tribes in North Dakota, as they did in South Dakota and in Montana for that matter, came together in the early and mid 60s and they convinced in North Dakota, the state of North Dakota, not to assume that civil and criminal jurisdiction. And so to this day, we still have our own tribal courts. We have our law and order either through the Bureau of Indian Affairs or directly by the tribal governments themselves. Notwithstanding the fact that there are issues and problems for our tribes to overcome and to continue to build infrastructure for those uh, public service kinds of programs, law enforcement more specifically, corrections, as well as the courts themselves. But nevertheless, they preserved and protected that jurisdiction in North Dakota, South Dakota, Montana, and a good portion, and uh, while a good portion in Minnesota went to the state of Minnesota over Indian tribes, with the exception of the Red Lake Band of Chippewa, and in Nebraska, all three tribes down there, or actually four tribes, are under the jurisdiction of the state of Nebraska. And so that has set a different course with respect to how tribes both govern themselves and how their people respond to what uh, happens with respect to their home areas. We have a lot of critics about those things, but one must look at tribal governments and tribal reservation areas, to me, as third world nations quasi-sovereign sovereign nations in the state uh, and in the nation itself. So that was the pivotal thing that happened in the mid-60s when we talk about the jurisdiction of tribes and tribal governments and the rights of Indians. Robert F. Kennedy's speech predates a lot of the things that were still not in existence at that time. And I mentioned this whole issue of, of civil rights for Native Americans. It pre his speech here in Bismarck predates the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, and it culminated shortly after this piece of law, the Indian Civil Rights Act of 1968. Uh, and after Kennedy's death, a number of other laws have been enabled. One called the Indian Self-Determination and Education Assistance Act of 1975, the Indian Religious Freedom Act of 1978, and more recently, the Indian Child Welfare Act and the Tribal Control Community Colleges and Universities Act of 1978, something that I worked on in great depth uh, to establish uh, 
uh, our own higher ed developing system. For, and we started from six tribal colleges in 1973, and we now have 37 of them uh, throughout the United States. But I point out that his speech and uh, the happening here in Bismarck was very, very historic in the sense that those things intersected in some ways uh, to become uh, uh, efforts that would become policy and policy that would become law. So after 1978, the progress towards self-determination for tribes was greatly curtailed by the U.S. Supreme Court in a decision called the Oliphant decision in 1978, which took away tribal jurisdiction over non-Indians on our reservations. And from 1978 to 2008, self-determination was minimally supported by Congress, except for things like the Indian Game Regulatory Act of 1988 and the recognition of a government-to-government -government re relationship by President Bill Clinton, whose term also included a separate presidential order for the tribal colleges and universities. And more recently, we now have a Tribal Law and Order Act of 2010 and a law called Violence Against Women Act of 2013, which will bring greater justice for Indian women throughout the United States, particularly in reservation areas, but also in areas where there may be questions that relate to uh, those women who are from federally recognized Indian tribes. So I, it sounds a bit boring, but you have to look at this from our perspective. You know, when the pilgrims came with their pride and landed on the shores here, they came, at least that's what I was taught in grade school, because they wanted to exercise their freedom of religion. We didn't have that choice. We had to have Congress enact a law that would give us the right to have religious freedom and to have practices that would enable our own spiritual and religious cultures. I mentioned that law in passing here just a little bit ago. And so we look at those kinds of things, and though we are the only people that are specifically recognized or spoken to about in the U.S. Constitution, We've had to go back and try to collect every one of those rights so that we can participate in America's well-being and in America's future, let's put it that way. Likewise, though, every one of our people, I won't say everyone, but the predominant majority of our people have given service to their country in the armed, armed services, armed forces. My father fought in the Battle of the Bulge. I have uncles and aunts that fought in the First World War, and Native people served in the Spanish-American War, Teddy Roosevelt's War. So we've served in every one of those wars going way, way back, in many cases without due citizenship. Not until 1924 were we uniformly declared United States citizens, by the way. And we are still earning those rights, if you will, to proclaim ourselves as citizens. So I look at that history and we see that these things have been hard fought, hard won, and hardly uh, and greatly appreciated. So often the voices of Native people are drowned out in the discussion of civil and social justice and civil rights, nationally and regionally. Yet here in North Dakota, we are by far the largest minority, not to mention that we were here before everyone else. A relatively recent example of this comes to mind. A few years ago, United Tribes hosted a discussion of human rights and, dis and issues of discrimination in Bismarck. Other local groups actually facilitated the discussion, and although Native Americans are the largest minority in Bismarck, they were, there were entire panels of five or six people where only one Native American was on a panel, in, or on a panel at all. In some respects, today's conference is not any different. I cannot possibly describe to you as one Native person all of the civil rights and social justice issues facing Native Americans in North Dakota. The civil rights issues we face are complex. There are Native Americans who live in our cities, those who are leaders of our Native nations within North Dakota, and those individuals who live on the reservations. Still other Native Americans are now enjoying the wealth of the oil boom. Each of these groups face different civil rights uh, challenges and social justice issues, and I cannot possibly do justice to all of these points of view. 
Despite the civil rights victories of the past 50 years, despite the modest success of things like Indian gaming, the challenges we as Native people face are enormous. These challenges are not simply the result of 500 years of oppression or the problem of being among the smallest of minorities, racial minorities that is. These are the problems of the general ignorance of who we are, peoples with a separate political, non-racial non -racial relationship with the United States of America. We are, as I mentioned, the only separate population explicitly recognized in the U.S. Constitution. Still, uh, some still or ignore the history and wish to treat us as if we should be seeking only to be assimilated into U.S. society and that we should be grateful for the opportunity to vote in elections and be honored with caricatures of who we are in athletic contests. Germans and Norwegians are emigrated, who emigrated to the U.S. don't think of themselves as citizens of Germany or Norway any longer, so why can't Indians do the same? Is this is, is the kind of unspoken attitude by some Native, uh, toward Native Americans, and we see this every day in our schools, our workplaces, and sometimes in our government officials. Others in our society resent that Native Americans are owed a fundamental, quote, trust responsibility by the United States of America, which is owed not because we are poor, although a good number of us still are, but because the U.S. promised you, us many things in solemn treaties ratified by the United States Senate, uh, treaties that are supposed to be the supreme law of the land, uh, and there because the U.S. took over three million square miles of our lands uh, to make up this great nation from sea to shining sea. Fundamental things like health care, housing, education, and so forth are all uh, which were forcibly taken from us and in many cases or in most cases of treaties were spoken to in those treaties as promises to be kept. If I sound a bit upset or angry after uh, this and after the speech of Robert F. Kennedy 50 years later, then we, then the uh, sitting U.S. Attorney General who addressed the convention of, uh, who addressed the convention of 1963 of the National Congress of American Indians and will be given a successor speech by Attorney General Eric Holder in a matter of weeks, uh, it is because of these past injustices. We recognized uh, Kennedy's speech at our recent intertribal summit here in Bismarck. The issues for many of us remain the same. Poverty, lack of recognition of our rights as sovereign nations, inadequate education, health care, housing, economic development, and youth and adult suicide that are at extremely high rates. I do not mean to ignore the progress that has been made as I mentioned, the oil boom has made one of our tribes in North Dakota relatively wealthy. But that wealth probably makes it even harder for the citizens of the Turtle Mountain Band of Chippewa to make their case for better housing and health care because they're not getting enriched because they don't have the oil wells, let's put it that way, and which are greatly needed. Or for the citizens of the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe of North and South Dakota, of which I am a, um, a citizen, to make the case for better law enforcement and educational opportunities. When we truly, what we truly need in our state and through our, our nation is an education system that recognizes and values who we are as Native people and as Native American. A recognition that our cultures, which are as old as the pyramids of Egypt, are worthy of consideration and praise so that our students do not feel that they are second-class citizens of the United States of America. It is not nearly enough to point out that Native Americans introduced Europeans to a broad variety of life-saving foods that we now take for granted in our society. It is not acceptable to say that we are being honored by a caric caricature in an athletic contest or that the name of the Washington, D.C. football team is meant to, quote, honor us. Our rights as separate peoples must be acknowledged and placed into a curriculum of every school in our nation, and the values that we hold sacred should be understood by all without reference 
to the mistaken notions of the past generations that we were primitive or somewhat, somehow defective in European eyes. It was not until 1924, as I mentioned, that we were declared US citizens. It was, not, it was during that period, by the way, that most anthropologists considered us human beings. The largest skeletal collection of human remains and skulls rests yet in the Smithsonian Institution. We can go and see all of the wonderful things, but remember, we are the largest bone collector of human remains in America, and we keep them in shells stored in the back room. I just mention these things not to create any kind of guilt on anyone or not to necessarily be blaming, but to assure you that we still have steps to take when it comes to both our behavior and our treatment of one another. Without understanding these history lessons, it is hard to work towards true reconciliation between Native Americans and the dominant society. Without a clear understanding of who we are and where we have been, it is very hard to obtain a sense of social justice or recognition of our civil rights at any level of society, whether in government, the courts, the workplace, or anywhere else. It is also hard to achieve a sense of justice and fair play in our state when we do not even have a human rights commission representative of the various groups and minorities uh, th uh, throughout this good state of North Dakota who have suffered some form of discrimination. And so I don't just refer to Native Americans, but all of those who are a part of our great society of North Dakota. Over and over again, Native Americans have been told that it is, it is acceptable for the dominant society to decide our fate for us. I grew up and attended many different schools, but one of those schools I graduated from was a Catholic Indian boarding school. And it was run with many of the stereotypes that we sometimes hear about, although I was coming toward the end of it. So treatment was a little more humane than what you would ordinarily read in some of the uh, different documents. But that was the closing of that kind of an era. But now we need to move a step further ahead into the future. A single white person at the head of North Dakota's labor departments makes determinations that affect our civil rights. How is that fair? A recent recommendation of the North Dakota Supreme Court's Commission on Racial and Ethnic Bias in the Courts was the creation of a Human Rights Commission in North Dakota. But that suggestion was not even brought up at the recent legislative sessions in North Dakota. We know racial profiling exists. It's happened to me. It happened to me just about a year and a half ago in this very city. And while I won't go into the details of that, I know that it happens to our students uh, from United Tribes as well as other ethnic or racial groups that sometimes come to this town or other cities. It's still well and alive. It's hard to describe that to someone who has never had to worry about it, but it does exist, I assure you. We know that this kind of thing continues. We are followed in the malls and assumed to be responsible for criminal activities. Native Americans represent nearly one third of the prison population in this state and nearly one half of the juveniles detained in our criminal justice system. That needs to change, but it will only change when attitudes of all citizens are affected by better education when economic imbalances are, are improved. These are just a few of the things that need to be done and need to be examined more closely that can help create a more just environment for Native Americans and for other specific populations. We are, in the end, still here. We will not go away anytime soon. We are, after all, still occupying our lands. We are in our homeland area, and we ain't leaving, folks. <laughs> so that's the point of where we're at in North Dakota. North Dakota has its biggest challenge since the days of the first people that came here. I'm, I'm not 100% Native American. Gip is German, by the way. And one of my ancestors came to North Dakota for the good graces and the opportunities in North Dakota during some of those early homestead areas, uh, era. And I tell you that because I recall on my mother's side, 
when Sitting Bull was killed. And when Sitting Bull was murdered, I use the word murder as opposed to just killed, everyone thought there was going to be a great big uprising. And so members of our family were told to move up to the agency or toward the agency of Fort Yates at that time. And many of them did. Part of my family were ranchers and part of my people were uh, from the prairie, let's put it that way, and just, just beginning to settle in. Some of my family were with the Reno group during the Custer fight. Some of my family were on the other side. So we see great conflict from our perspective that occurred. Sometimes things are called battles, sometimes they're called massacres. And we still seem to have to rectify and justify our perspective of things. We must come together on these kinds of things. I look at the Kildare Mountains and the most recent public issue that we've taken a stand on at United Tribes with all of our tribal leaders because as you know, they sit on my board. And they voted the other day to oppose the line that will go through the Kildare Mountains through private property. And it's not just the battlefield idea. One of the reasons why we oppose a line going through that area, even though it's privately held, it isn't under the juris over the, uh, held by uh, public lands by the state of North Dakota or by the federal government. But one of the reasons why we oppose anything going through that particular area, not just because of the battlefield, but because there are dead lying there. They are buried. They were buried in a mass grave by the, by the U.S. military right after that battle of Kildare Mountains. And so it's the issue of people and bodies, children and women and elders and men that are buried there. Some say 150. One of the ranch owners I've talked to in recent years said it's much higher than that. Much, much higher. Even though there was an inventory done by the State Historical Society in 1915, we need to go back and re-examine these things and see what is really there and not just the significance of the battle. Because cannon was put in there before the troops ever went in and shot people. Many of those people were dead. So we must give homage and we must give good prayer for those that lie in that place at this point in time. And I know the private owners have been very good, by the way, in extending the right of people to come in and look at those areas. And we appreciate that. But we must always recognize that progress, measured as progress, simply for the economics of it, is not always progress. That we must recognize the humanity and what was there and sometimes forgotten. We have many places where our people are buried that you will never find. My brother created something at Standing Rock called the Chief's Ride. And one of the things we did in the early years when we were first settled at Standing Rock is Many of our chiefs and families refused to give up our dead. We took them and buried them ourselves. And oftentimes, they were buried in places away from the mainstay of what were called the religious or Christian religion uh, burial cemeteries. Now those families are coming forward, and we do a ride every spring, a horse ride, and we go throughout the different areas and communities, some in the villages, some in the open countryside. And we commemorate where those people are buried. Families have begun to come forward and tell us where they're buried because they refused to give that to the government in the past. Sitting Bull, of course, was refused burial in St. Peter's Catholic Cemetery when he was brought up from South Dakota after he was shot and he wouldn't want to have been buried there anyhow because he wasn't Christian. But he laid there for many, many years before he was reinterred in South Dakota, which is another story. But the whole point is, we are now coming forward with the idea of who we are and what we're about. We had to hide these things. From 1890, the year that Sitting Bull was murdered, to 1949, all of our spiritual and religious ceremonies were banned. And you can only hold them in secret. I mentioned this Indian Religious Freedom Act that was just passed uh, some 20 years ago to regain some of our spirituality and religions.
So those are things that we still may look very distantly in the past, but we have to correct them and make them better for today and for tomorrow. I digress too much, and I apologize for doing that. I wish you well, and I thank you for listening to me. Thank you very much. Dr. Gibb, do you know who the two gentlemen are in, in that photograph there? Do you you know, I, I actually don't know these gentlemen. I've been trying to find their names. I think one of them is a Blackfeet uh, chief, but I don't know the name. Yeah. protection for Indian women, do you think that education uh, has a lot to do with that or, um, or it would be one way or what did you, could you go into that more? Thank you. I think I mentioned uh, the Violence Against Women's Act, is that what you're referring to and uh, is that what uh, you were, your question pertained to? Yes. 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 Um, that's a, a, a recent uh, law that was put into place and it sets up uh, fundamental procedures and protections for Native American women in particular. And it is, uh, it's an important piece because we know that violence against women and violence against Indian women is particularly uh, bad, let's put it that way. And so we've had to have, uh, we've lobbied for many years for this law and putting it in place. So it's, it's a relatively new piece and we're seeing how it's being implemented, uh, particularly on the reservation areas where there can be protections. Uh, we sponsor a program at my college campus for uh, Native American women, by the way. Uh, uh, and we work very closely, for example, with the Adult uh, Abused Resource Center here in Bismarck, we have a, we have a partnership uh, where, in this case, Native American women can seek shelter. We don't actively do it on our own campus because we need to keep those, those kinds of uh, considerations uh, safe and safe houses for women that are, that are under those kinds of threats. I don't know if that addresses what you were uh, uh, looking at. Other questions? If not, Oh, there, there are, okay. <laughs> Sorry. I don't want to use up all our time here. Oh, we've got time. Um, Dr. Gibb, I'm teaching North Dakota Studies right now, and on Mondays where we get into American Indian cultures, and you mentioned that we shouldn't dwell on European views of American Indians. What would you suggest that I stress in my class? Uh, that we shouldn't dwell on European... European view, like older European views of American Indian cultures um, as if they're subhuman. What would you stress that well, we do? Well, I, I guess what I'm referring to are some of the stereotypes. Not so much, I mean, it's fine that we all have views and some of those views, I mean, I, I can think of the Germans in Germany who, by the way, there's a, there's a group of German clubs in Germany that practice uh, principally Lakota, but other tribal dances and, and uh, 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 heritage of our native people, particularly Lakota and Dakota people. And we've had some of them come over to our annual uh, powwow, by the way. And many of them dress in 19th century style. They've created their, their outfits so that they're 19th century, more, in some ways more authentic than ours. And some of them even speak Lakota, but it's Lakota that is more related to 19th century style. Some of you that are German or Norwegian would understand that, that when your father or your grandmother or grandfather or great-grandfather, whoever it was that came over, spoke a form of German or Norwegian that was spoken then. 
and it's like you got lost or stayed, stood still in time, you're speaking, if you learn from them, that same dialect and that same form of language of the 18th or 19th, probably 19th century. And if you go to Germany, they're going to ask you what you're talking about. Because that language is 20th or 21st century, right? It's changed. And that's the same with Native American or American Indian cultures. I once had a heck of a discussion with a very well-known uh, American Indian professor, non-native, who said, you're not real anymore. You're not traditional. You're not this and you're not that. And I said, I am too. And we had this huge argument. Well, that person was dating us from the time that she studied us, let's put it that way, and put us in a bottle, and that was uh, that. That was who she studied. I wasn't living up to the 18th or 19th century standard that she had put upon us. Anyhow, I don't know if that answers your question. I think we have to learn how to overcome stereotypes, though. You know. We've got about two more minutes, so make them quick. I had read just a few days ago in the Bismarck Tribune, um, uh, if I understand this right, three affiliated tribes asking for some lands to be returned, and I didn't really understand it, and I'm wondering, this is a current issue, and I'm wondering if you could speak some t to that? Well, I'm certainly not the legal or expert on that. Uh, those, are, if I'm correct, those are principally uh, lands that were originally the tribes, as I understand it, and second, or for the most part, there may be some exceptions to some of that acreage, but the U.S. Corps of Engineers owns or, or, or has control of those lands, and so they're asking for the return of some of those core lands uh, back to the tribe, and therein comes the debate about whether they should or shouldn't and who they ought to belong to, and who ought to have jurisdiction. In the case of the U.S. Corps of Engineers, you're talking about direct federal jurisdiction over those lands. So that's, in a nutshell, the way I understand what Fort Berthold would like to do is have those lands returned to them in terms of their original ownership. You mentioned a lot of issues of social justice and civil rights affecting Native Americans in North Dakota. What, in your opinion, is the most pressing and what could I or other non-Native people do? Um, I think when we talk about things like employment, uh, that's one thing. Um, uh, employers in North Dakota are changing rapidly. We have new companies in North Dakota and their outlook is different than what we have seen in the past from many of our North Dakota companies. And so a lot of our businesses, I think, either are or will have to uh, get, uh, get cracking with changing their attitudes towards people of color, let's put it that way. We're seeing more people of color, not just Native Americans but we're seeing more people of color who are seeking employment here, opportunity here, and that's the same for many of our young Native Americans. A lot of our young, young Native Americans are telling us, I'm talking United Tribes, that they will go where the job is, as opposed to just going home. And so that's part of the bet we're taking as we train people at my place or we provide education for them to get a certificate or a degree. Uh, I think in terms of attitude, we need to think a little bit differently about some of our stereotypes of one another and how that needs to change. And so we need to do more education of both employers and potential employees and what we're doing with our civic and uh, elected leadership, by the way, that they have a better idea. Companies that come here that want to move to Bismarck, I've been on some of the committees that have, have uh, welcomed potential new companies in. And many of those companies that, want, companies that are coming here that want to be in North Dakota ask the question, so what is your diversity? What kind of makeup is your population? And what is your outlook on diversity to civic leaders and to business leaders? And we have to have the right answers. Let's put it that way. I think we do, but we have to work harder at it. Join with me thanking Dr. Gipp for uh, Thank you.